heading high up into the mountains today. Not to enjoy the lovely scenery, but to um, go into an old slate mine, go all the way down to the bottom of it and try and fix a, um, a small Pelton turbine that's not behaving itself. I'll explain a bit more about when I get there. Um, got to drive up into the valley first. This is really uh, coming up now the end of the road or the tarmac road and then it becomes more of a mountain track. But it's, uh, it's not too um, <coughs> it's not too rough. So get as, as high as you can get on a normal road here. track goes up into the mountains and up here there's a number of um, very old slate mines one of which is a mine that I know particularly well for a number of different reasons called Camorthin and it's that mine I'm visiting today to go do the work I've got to do There's a number of other mines up here too. There's one on the left called Rizgan, which is a, a lovely mine that's higher than Camorthin. And then further along, there's another one called Konglog, which is only small. If you keep going further, you get to another large slate mine called Rossith, which is a mine that I've not done an awful lot in over the years, really. I, I do know it, but um, I've only been in a few times. But it's Camorthan I'm visiting today. It's the mine that I know uh, by far the uh, the best up in this valley. And it's a vast place. It's absolutely vast. There's um, in excess of 60 miles of tunnel in it and a thousand chambers. And today I need to go right down to the bottom of it. beautiful valley up here. Sometimes when the weather's nice it feels like the most beautiful place in the world. A lot of people come up here to do photography and enjoy the tranquility so they tend to scowl at me a little bit when I come past in my V8 Range Rover. But hey, I'm going to put up with it for long and I'm on my way. friend Sean is working his digger in here at the moment to make the uh, the entrance to the mine a little bit nicer. You can just see the entrance just up there. Um, I need to put my helmet and wellies on before I go any further. 
All right then. And off we go. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about this mine as I'm making my journey through it. As I said before, its name is Camorthin. It is a slate mine, a North Wales slate mine. And it's Victorian, so it's late 1800s was its heyday. Back then. North Wales produced about 90% of the world's slate production, which is um, a lot more than it is now, that's for sure. That's why there's a lot of big slate mines here, not just mines but quarries as well. But for the most part, they're all abandoned now. Just miles and miles of abandoned tunnels. And I've spent quite a lot of my uh, years wandering around these old state mines, finding ways into them and exploring them. And this particular one I know quite well. It's one of the biggest. Really, it's the biggest of the, uh, the slate mines in North Wales. It's a good 60 miles of tunnel in here, if not a bit more. Not that I've seen all that. A lot of it you can't get into anymore. It's collapsed or the way into it has collapsed, or it's flooded. Various different reasons why you can't get into all of it, but most of what you can get into now I have seen in here. But that's only a small portion really of what there was back in the day. Now I need to descend this internal uh, shaft here, it's called an inclined shaft, it's very steep but it's not vertical so you can with care climb down it and try not to fall over, especially if you're holding a camera and a torch, it's achievable. It's at the bottom floor of this mine there is a small hydroelectric turbine, a Pelton wheel, or something very similar to a Pelton wheel. And it's not running very well. It just generates a very small amount of electricity. And by very small amount, I mean about 10 watts. And uh, it seems to have conked out, so I'm gonna go and see if I can fix it. I've decided to come through this part of the mine instead of going the most direct way. This part's called the old vein. And it wouldn't normally come this way. But I fancy to change from the, the, the more normal route one would take this way is a little bit more difficult. Not not hugely so. be able to get off this incline in a minute and use some old stairs. Okay. Let's 
So I'm now on the level of floor A. I was on floor one. One is the top floor, or at least the top floor that that I've been on. And I've descended to A now. And my next job is to descend to B, which is a bit more civilised than scrambling down that incline. There's some lovely stairs here. I say lovely, and well they are lovely, but they're extremely slippy. It's very easy to fall over on these. I have done many times, and I've watched many other people fall on them as well. And I'm doing it holding a camera now. I must be careful. I have to be extra careful today because I'm completely on my own in this mine. So if I end up getting injured, then um, it'll be a long wait. People do know I'm in here. So people will come and look for me at some point, but although it didn't come to that. It's a big mind to be searching for somebody. These stairs all date from about 1880. Possibly a little later actually. Possibly about 1890. Thinking about it. This is something I wanted to show you as we passed. This is a huge cavern and it, it is a big cavern. There's an enormous drop down there. It's a long way. To the bottom of there is, I don't know, a few hundred feet. Not somewhere I particularly want to be falling. But over the chamber is this uh, suspension bridge. I'm sure you'd agree it's very nice. And I'll just walk over it very carefully. Because the last thing I want to do is fall off it. Uh, wobbles a lot. Okay, got to get now from B floor to C floor. And looking down that um, remains that incline there is the way you would normally go. Um, but I'm going a way that I actually prefer, even though it's a little bit more hazardous. Um, it's a bit easier underfoot, I think. And it's just in this chamber here. As long here, I've not been here for a while. There is um, a route down, down there, you can just about see it. There's a bit of a beaten path through all this roof fall, it's collapsed from up here in the roof, and provides quite a convenient way down from here if I'm careful tricky while holding a camera. I'm going to make my way down to the next floor. Now, this is something that uh, always scares me a little bit. I don't come this way very often, but you just see on the camera here is a very, very old, as in 1880s wooden bridge. Pretty rotten and it's spanning a drop of, oh, I don't know how deep that is but it's not a survivable drop, that's the important point. It's very soggy and there's just planks of wood holding it up. I always walk quite carefully over this. It's 
see one of the old chains holding it up. They're not all there, some of the chains have fallen away. There we go. Back on solid ground again. Yeah. These railway lines, and the tram lines. They always scare me a bit because, as you can see, they basically just end here, just on this cliff face. That's a good 20 metres drop there. You'll get a bit nearer the edge. I suppose you'd be able to see down there on the camera, maybe. It's 20 metres anyway, it's a long way. Actually, it might even be a bit more than that looking at it. I always find passing this a bit unnerving. You can see it's the remains of a bridge support and the bridge has collapsed. There's just the middle bit of it left. And just a huge drop below down to not much broken rocks. It's another 20 odd metres down there. Unfortunately you don't need to uh, cross this bridge because you can't because it's not there. There is a way around just to the side if you're really careful. It's just a bit of an old chain to, I don't know, if you slip you don't want to grab that. I suppose you'd have to. I don't know if it stopped you. And down there is deep water. Probably can't see it on the camera so easy. That regains the tunnel here. Oh yeah, I forgot about this. There's an old wagon sat here. The miners left it behind. Don't really know why. Probably because it was too hard to get out. Or maybe the bridge collapsed while this was on this side. And therefore they couldn't get it round anymore. I don't suppose they'd be able to get it round that little ledge I just walked across. You know, no bridge trapped the wagon. They've taken the slate out of it though, but left the wagon behind. That'll be too heavy to carry. There must be a good ton in that. A bit further along, you can see another one. This one's upside down and the wheels have come off. I'm willing to bet this one fell here because if you look up, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, right at the end of my light's travel there is a tunnel directly above and I reckon this wagon got pushed out of the tunnel by accident. It's crashed here in bits on the floor and they've not bothered to try and recover it. It's lay here ever since. Last time men worked in these chambers was the 1890s. It's probably been here since then. I forgot about this bit. This is one bit I don't like coming this way. The tunnel just ends at a sheer drop there, and that's the edge, but the, the platform is over there to get to, so you have to do a bit of a leap of faith, holding these old chains here. Um, it's a bit of a step there. Yep. And the bottom. No, it's not too bad. Okay, I need to leave this floor now. I have to descend deeper again. And the only way to do that now is down this chute. There's a little bit of a waterfall going down as well, as you can see. But the mine's water. Because it's so wet, it's important to be 
careful as possible. Quite steep. Quite awkward. If you really mess it up, at the bottom is a big pool of quite deep water. I'm going to try and avoid. If you come to the side of this chamber, there is a way you can scramble down without having to go in there. Swimming in mines is something I try and avoid, especially if it's unscheduled. Alright, I'm down at the water's edge now. Very conveniently, there's small pipes here and they cross over the deeper water. Uh, but they are underwater themselves, but only by about six inches. So if I balance on the pipes, then I won't fall in. Now the water either side of the pipes isn't that deep, but it would certainly be at least chest depth on me. And I could do without that. There we are, back on dry ground again. This tunnel that I'm walking along now goes for quite a long way. Eventually it will lead me to another incline descending down to the bottom accessible floor of the mine. As we pass this, I wanted to just point it out to you. It's um, it's a drill. It's an air drill made by I think it's Holman's. This one probably say on it. Um, let's have a look. Yeah, that's right, you probably can't see on the camera, uh, but that says Holman, Holman um, Light Drifter, and that was used by the quarrymen for stitch drilling. What I mean by stitch drilling is cutting a big slab of rock by drilling a series of holes in a line like you're, like you're stitching. Um, hence the um, the mechanism to to move it left and right. There, that's where the uh, the air would feed in, and also water to cool the drill bit and suppress the dust because they were very uh, very dusty when those drills were going. I've um, seen these working. They're very noisy, very dusty. This drill might look like it's been here uh, for many, many decades, but it hasn't actually. Uh, this drill has been in the mine for many, many decades, but it's not been in this exact place. Um, despite the fact it weighs an absolute ton, it's been moved several times and it's, um, it's life down here in the mine because the chamber it was originally in was um, in quite serious danger of collapse. So an enthusiastic group of uh, cavers came along to it with some big spanners and lots and lots of penetrating oil and uh, dismantled it into carryable parts, which is to their great credit, and moved it quite a long way um, through the mine to a much safer location so that it wouldn't get squashed under few thousand tons of roof fall. Um, so hats off to him for doing that. It is a lovely old drill and it would have been very commonplace to see see these about in the mines back in the day. There's very few of them left now because they would have taken them away again at the, at the end of the mines working life because if they're still functional and they're worth money why leave them here to rot away but this particular one they seem to have forgotten about and it's been down here for a very long time. I don't know how old it is. It could be 1940s, 1950s. 
Um, so it is a, it's older than the chamber that it's sat in that's um, going to be very early 1900s, this particular chamber, I'd have thought. I don't know exactly. A bit further along we're coming into an area that I've always found very interesting. First of all, have a look at this. It's a little building in a slate mine. It's a little office. It's old, 1930s I expect. Somebody would have worked in here at a desk. Lots of old graffiti. Most of the graffiti is from the 1960s and 70s when people used to sneak in here. Um, the building itself would have had a proper window, a slate roof and a, and a door. You can imagine it being quite nice in there with a little, um, perhaps a paraffin stove, paraffin lamp maybe. And then you see this. Same period, early 30s I expect. These huge drums, cable on. This is called an incline head. There had been a big electric motor up there. Uh, it seems to have gone, I guess the scrap men took that when the mine closed. But the reason for it is because over here, there's another one of these steep tunnels down we call inclines, the cables would have pulled wagons up the hill. Far too steep to push them up the hill, especially when they've got a couple of tons of slate on them. So the big motor and the, the cable hauled the wagons up. The tracks are missing now, I guess the scrapmen had them as well. Um, but that's what it was for. Right. This is how I descend even deeper into the mine again. Lovely old staircase. And about the best one I think on the route. This is taking me down, it's a ramp. It's taking me down to F floor. It's getting quite warm now, I'm getting quite deep underground. I am about here, 1,200, 1,300 feet vertically from the surface but I've still got a fair way to go to get to my destination right, I've got to descend again now but I haven't got any nice stairs so I'm going to have to just hop down these little Little bits of rock, it's not particularly difficult to do. Ooh, that gets me onto the incline proper. I'm just gonna have to slip and slide my way down this. It's not particularly difficult. There's um, flood water down there, something floating in it. I don't think I've ever seen that before. Let's go and have a look, see what it is. Sincerely hope it's not a person or something. I doubt it. Be a bit of old wood. Uh, yeah, there it is. See if I can zoom in on my camera so you can see. Can you see it? Possibly not. It is just a bit of wood. Don't know why it's there though. It must have bubbled up from deeper underground, under the water. Not going that way though. We are going this way.
This is one of my favourite parts of the mine. It's another another building. Outside, a number of old shelves covered in um, sort of artifacts and things, really, like old bottles, bits of broken crockery, bits of machinery. Uh, all kinds of bits and bobs. There's an old kettle there, look. It's quite sweet. A detonator tin. No, no detonators in it. And here's the entrance to the Queen Mary Cafe. That's what's written up above the door. Probably can't make it out on the camera. Maybe you can. It says Queen Mary Cafe. Lovely old cabin. I'm a big fan of this place. It's missing its roof. It's also missing its tables and chairs and paraffin heaters. And most importantly, a big group of very jolly quarrymen and miners that would have sat in here. Um, every uh, every lunchtime to have their, their food. Oh, there's a lighter there. And a candle, look at that. <laughs> Works. Somebody must come down here and have lunch. Maybe I'll turn my head torch off. Oh, that's quite sweet. Not very bright though. That's all the miners would have had to work with, a candle. It's going out. No, oh, I think it's gone out. It's either due to a lack of oxygen or it's just too damp. I'm being dramatic. It's not a lack of oxygen. There's loads of air down here. It looks a bit eerie. Okay, this is what I've come here to have a look at and try and fix. very slowly. You see it's a uh, very old turbine being fed from the hose here and it goes in around there and down into the turbine. It spins the, the cog there then turns the the, the alternator there, it's a three-phase alternator. Uh, yes, that turbine is extremely old. It's, um, I think it's early 1900s. It says the Thermia, no, sorry, the Thermia motor. Don't know much about it. Never seen another one. Um, it's not from this mine. Some uh, very good colleagues of mine brought it down here. Um, I'm glad I missed that day. And I've set it up, but it's, it's my job to maintain it and keep it running. Uh, it's running very, very slowly, really. Although it is under electrical load, so just to keep it under control. So here, there's a big electric resistor. It's warm, but that's all. And if I disconnect using this blade switch, disconnect it. It's not under load anymore. You see it's spinning right up. It's getting a lot more enthusiastic. It's still quite feeble. 
Um, it's still not running anywhere near as powerful as it should. And the pressure gauge is showing two and a half bar. If I turn the valve off, see that shoot right up. You can see it shot right up to about 10, but that's just because the um, flex and the, the, the plastic piping is settling. Uh, it'll actually settle at about six and a half bar, give or take, so that's an excess of 60 meters head. Um, so it's plenty of pressure, um, but it's, it's only a very small feed pipe. It's only uh, an internal diameter of about 20 millimeters. Now there's a, like a, a um, an ejection valve here for open that. That's quite powerful, really. Uh, that's shooting about 10 meters into the void there. So there's, there's quite a bit of water there, but it doesn't seem to um, do a lot in the turbine. And I think that is because well, my guess is that um, in here there's a nozzle. It's like a, like a comb with a hole in the end, and it's that it gives you the, the blast of water down to turn the, uh, turn the turbine. I, I'm going to hazard a guess that that, that nozzle thick on block with a little stone perhaps. So I'm going to have to take all this apart and see if I can figure it out. That's what I'm going to do. Because I want to do a fore and after, uh, a before and after weather, the pipe clearance makes much difference. With no load at all, the voltmeter is showing. You can, uh, if you can see it there, uh, what's it showing? 16 volts. It's kind of fluctuating between 15 and 16 volts. That's its open voltage. Um, with absolutely no load, that will drop down to hardly anything if you put a load on it. Um, that gives you an idea of the, the speed, hopefully that's going to go up. So it's fluctuating between 15, 16, I said 14 a minute ago. So see if we can get that a bit higher, hopefully into the 20s. Well, that's See what we can do with this. First thing to do is turn the uh, the water down. Okay. They, there's two quite small bolts. They look about half inch. Hoping they will turn, they don't look like they've turned for many, many years. That should give me access to the um, to the nozzle. Let's try it. Oh yeah, it's turning. This isn't really the right wrench for this. I didn't know what size the um, the bolt was. some old Whitworth thing I would imagine. This one turns as well. Looks a little bit more corroded. This one. Oh, that's uh, quite reluctant. That one. Nope. This is going to be the showstopper for the day. Come on, little, little bolt. Let's have it. Oh, by me. 
is not keen to turn at all. If it doesn't, I'm in a bit of a pickle. Oh, there we go, it's moved. Thank goodness for that. <laughs> this assembly moves now. So we can find out why it's not running very powerfully. I'm hoping I'm just going to see a little stone stuck in the jet that I'll just be able to lift out with my finger and that'll be it. There's nothing more complicated than that. Come on, come on little bolt, there we go. Should just lift off now. Right. What's the nozzle? It looks actually fairly clear. That is it. Wow. Something's wrong with that. So why are we getting such rubbish performance? Not much friction on it. The angle of frost seems to make a difference. I don't know how you'd adjust that then. A bit of a sweet spot there. The gauge is reading. Gauge is reading 20, 21.
very hard to find that sweet spot. Twenty-one. Well, I'm pleased to say that it's going a little bit faster now. Um, we've got a reading of about 22. Uh, it went up to 23 a second ago. Um, which is a lot more healthy. Still under no load at all. I actually found that um, the nozzle angle wasn't quite right. It was set to, to shoot straight down, um, but by putting a bit of an angle on it, by crudely putting in a bit of um, slate into the union there, it's directed the jet slightly into the wheel, and it's um, getting a lot more force than it did. So I've got this Pelton wheel going really about as powerful as I'm likely to get. Um, it's producing 15 watts of electricity, which is fairly pitiful really. I was hoping for, well, about 100 times that. Um, it's not going to solve the um, international reliance on fossil fuels, um, not on its own anyway. But it generates 15 watts. Um, which for a 60 meter head of water isn't a lot. Um, there's a lot of friction in the system. You know, the, this particular alternator is quite hard to turn because of the big magnets in it. It's actually off a wind turbine, this. Um, the motorbike chain, it's all quite heavy, so there's not really a lot of power left at the end. Um, but there is 15 watts, and to be honest, that, that is serviceable because um, all we want this turbine to do is charge a small um, sealed lead acid battery, something the size of a car battery, and just trickle charge it and just keep it on, uh, keep it on charge uh, down here at the bottom of the mine. And it means that there is some power available for recharging like lamp batteries uh, or even a small inverter. So you could power a small device down here if you had to. Um, it just gives you access to some electricity. Uh, so, you know, if it's a reasonable battery, um, there's a, a bit, bit of power there you can tap into if you need it. Um, and then when you leave it, um, this uh, turbine will, will charge it back up slowly. At, at 15 watts, it's going to take a while, but you know it's got forever to do it in. The, the water supply to it will never run out. It goes to a huge body of water, um, high above. Uh, well, 60 metres above actually, and that's a big body of water and the water pouring into that is a lot more than it's taking out so it's never going to run out.